Hi, I'm Carolyn Davis, a Safe Work Australian member representing the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I'd like to welcome our studio audience and those of you who are watching online uh, to today's virtual seminar, Becoming a Mentally Healthy Small Business. This important discussion is appropriately being conducted during Mental Health Week. Firstly, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Our focus today is on the special challenge and, uh, and psychological health of those who operate our work in small business. Um, small businesses make an enormous contribution to the Australian economy. Across Australia, there are over 770,000 small businesses and about 1 million independent contractors. We estimate that small businesses and sole traders together employ over 3 million workers, or about 31% of, of their total workforce. At Safe Work Australia and the Australian Chamber, we're very aware of the pressures experienced by many small businesses, their long working hours, the need to deliver often with very limited money um, and very limited people, time and equipment. And our own Australian Chamber data and Safe Work Australia research tells us that they often find the burden of paperwork quite onerous. Whether it's just from the demands of the day-to-day -day business or the paperwork required to demonstrate their business's ability to meet the sort of quality and uh, safety standards they want. Um, we uh, know that the we, sorry, we know that the benefits of mentally healthy workplaces are there and we know that mental illness has a serious burden, um, a serious human and economic costs. Um, in 2013, there were over 9,000 accepted uh, workers' compensation claims for mental disorders and that means with over $340 million that's paid in compensation. Whatever the figures, the prevention is really the key. Um, we know um, that people experience mental illnesses that can arise from a combination of factors. For example, we come with our genetics, our personality, exposure to stressful life events such as bereavements and serious illnesses and prolonged stress at work. Importantly, we've got some recent research that shows that one in five Australians aged 16 to 85 experience a mental illness each year. These can vary from mildly distressing to seriously debilitating. The most common mental illnesses are the depressive, anxiety and substance use disorders. And often there are th these three types of mental illnesses occurring in combination. Sadly, we also have each day around six Australians that uh, die from suicide and a further 30 people will attempt to take their own life. Given how uh, the statistics, these statistics show, um, at one time or another, we're likely to work with people or indeed ourselves experience periods of poor mental health. So it's in everyone's interest to discuss this important topic and know where to go for information or help. So it's good to have some knowledge. Today, we will hear from three panellists. Their full biographies are on our website. They're a bit weighty to go through today. Um, so first, let me introduce Anne Sherry. She is the CEO of, the Carna of Carnival Australia, the largest cruise ship operator in Austra Australasia, and she's also our Safer Work Australia chair. Anne holds a number of non-executive roles in large Australian companies. And in 2001, she was awarded a Centenary Medal and in 2004, an Order of Australia for her contribution to the Australian community. Our second panellist is Georgie Harmon. She was appointed CEO of Beyond Blue in 2014. Previously, the Deputy CEO at the Na National Mental Health Commission, she's also worked in the private sector. I am delighted we've also with us today Leanne Faulkner. From 2004 to 2012, Leanne established and ran Billy Goat Soap, um, which she grew from a kitchen-based hobby to a highly successful small business. Uh, Leanne understands well the strains and pressures faced by small business owners today and fought her own battle with situational depression triggered by tough trading times and conditions. Last but not least, let me introduce today's facilitator, Mr Barry Sheriff, an acknowledged thought leader in work health and safety. 
before we start, we're going, just going to listen to a couple of compelling stories that remind us of why we are here today. 6 to 8 months ago, I became really unwell. I started having um I I had a, a psychotic episode and it was it was really awful and I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone about it or tell anyone what was going on. I'd never told anyone before um apart from my doctor after it had happened that, you know, um, I'd experienced psychosis. Elsa is my boss. Um, it, it, she was very, very encouraging. And when I first told Elsa what was going on, uh, her initial reaction to me was, you, you really need to go back to your doctor and you really need to sit down and, and work out a plan and discuss this further with him. My manager um, just generally made me feel comfortable in my role and I knew she respected me as an employee and an asset to her business so I had had no problems in, in telling her what was going on. I felt that it would be a positive thing to do. I love going to work. It's a very positive place to be. Staying well to me means taking my medication. That's the number one thing on my list, is that I have to take my medication. And I like to run, um, which I also find really helpful. I have regular check-ins with my doctor and you know try to be doing different things. Having a mental illness is no different to having diabetes or cancer or any of those things. It's just a matter of going through, finding out what works with your doctor and, and following through with that. I think it's also very important. They both other people that don't understand it and still don't understand it to this day. Um, but considering that the support has just been phenomenal. Like, probably had three months off work after the first attempt and I probably got a message off either one of them every week or two just asking how I was. It wasn't when he came back to work, it was, you know, how are you? Well, welcome everybody to the webinar today. It's a very important topic and those videos certainly demonstrate how important uh, the issue of mental health uh, is to us all. Uh, but I, I must say that the, the videos also provide some hope uh, and identify opportunities for us all, both individually and as businesses, uh, in dealing with the issues as they arise and helping us all through um, the issues when they do arise. We do have an excellent panel today with a wide variety of experiences uh, and a lot of contribution to be made to the topic. But I would encourage everybody online to also contribute, uh, provide us with your questions so that we can actually make sure that this is most relevant to those who are tuning in today, watching this, and wanting to take away information. It's important that it's very relevant to you, so I would really do encourage you to uh, provide us with your web questions, uh, and we will, throughout the course of the session, uh, take those questions and put them to uh, members of the panel. Before we start, I think, uh, or to start, uh, what we do need to do is to make sure that it is clear exactly what we're talking about. Uh, there are many labels that are thrown around, uh, there are many, thing, many descriptions. Um, what is it that we're actually talking about? So if I could ask you, Anne, um, can we start by clearing up some of the language uh, that people use when they talk about mental disorders and mental illness and so forth? And also, this is described as becoming a mentally healthy small business. What does a mentally healthy workplace look like? 
Hmm, weighty questions. <laughs> Let me start with the last one first, actually, because I think um, healthy workplaces, whether it's mentally healthy or just a healthy workplace, have the same sort of characteristics. You get support on the job, you're treated with respect. Uh, if something goes wrong, people ask you how you are and look to help you. So I don't think it matters whether it's mentally healthy or generally healthy. The same sort of culture, environment, really describes uh, a great place to work. And we all know it when we work in those sort of places. You want to go there and it doesn't matter what's happening in your life. You feel as though you can talk about it and people will help you if you need help or treat you with respect. So I think um, any, I'm sure there's you know, much more uh, language that people would like to wrap around that. But I think if we keep it simple mm. and are just clear about the basics of great workplaces, then we can get there. Uh, I think in terms of the other language, you know, there's a lot of uh, specific language used around anxiety, depression and so on. Uh, we've been using the term mental disorder and we're going to use that today. So that's really when you know that things aren't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> things aren't quite right. That, um, uh, but it hasn't tipped into mental illness when you need some sort of medication or a really uh, more significant intervention. And lots and lots of people have mental disorder. You know, I think the, we heard some of the statistics a minute ago. Lots of people feel anxiety. Lots of people are stressed. Um, there's a lot going on in our lives. Uh, there are people whose fam members of their family have died. You know, going through those sorts of moments. And I think that's when the term mental disorder is, is widely used and probably takes away the stigma, I think, of some of the specific labels and others here I'm sure can talk about that better than I can but you destigmatize mm. <coughs> so you know th again keep let's keep that simple mental disorders they're the the things that lots of people have anxiety depression whatever label you want to put on it and mental illness is really when you tip over into needing um, a full intervention mm. a number of points come from from those answers uh, one is that it is important to have destigmatization uh, and that is part of the healthy workplace um, and also the point about early intervention. And I love the, the point that was made by Katie on the video that uh, it's, it's an illness, you know, it's mm. no different to diabetes or whatever, it just happens to, to be a mental illness as opposed to a physical illness. But we need to, to accommodate in the way we have all other illnesses and issues that people have to deal with in their lives. This is just another one of those things, which is why I like the idea of healthy workplaces having almost a generic um, flavour to them, whether it's uh, about managing some sort of mental illness or it's about managing anything else that's going on in people's lives. So we all spend a lot of time at work, so we want our workplaces to be places we can speak up, look for support, um, talk to other people about what's going on, share, share you know, pain and as well as joy. It's, uh, it's a place that you want to go and to be able to have those sort of conversations. Yeah. So a healthy, a mentally healthy workplace is one that does in fact provide that support. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So whether or not it's related to the work itself or whether it's uh, quite separate from work, uh, the workplace itself yeah. can assist. And simple things mm. help. And uh, some of the campaigns that uh, Georgie and others have, you know, campaign campaign for and championed fantastically. Even things like, "Are you okay?" You know that the simplicity of saying to people who sit next to you or you you run into all the time at work, "Are you okay?" Uh, as a as just a common courtesy, a good question to ask people. So there's a sense of that incredible engagement, uh, which you know again is makes your workplace feel supportive. You start to be able to speak about things that maybe you can't speak about in other parts of your life or other environments that you're in. Mm. And certainly that came through from, from particularly Katie's video as well. Yeah, it was, one, it was a wonderful uh, yeah. vignette actually about someone yeah. who not only spoke up uh, but who spoke to her boss, found she was supportive. Mm. You know, that's the dynamic really that you want. And in small businesses, which of course we're talking about today as well, uh, they're very, you have very personal relationships often in small businesses. You know everyone, uh, you're with them a lot. There might be family members or extended family in small businesses. It's uh, 
of all the environments where this should be manageable. I know we always talk about the things that are hard to do for small business, but I think the personal relationships in many small businesses and the dependence on the people who work for you and with you make it even more important that you're open to those conversations. Mm. Well, certainly the, the dynamic of the organisation, the environment, the relationships and so forth is, is very critical to this. But um, as you've mentioned before, think of it not as something that's quite separate, but it is an illness. Um, of a type just as a physical illness now, it might be. Uh, physical illnesses, of course, a contributor to those is the design of the work itself as well as, of course, the equipment. Mm. Um, what about with uh, mental illness and disorder? I think it's the same. You know, mm. the um, designing work around people is the way it should happen. And whether it's mental illness, physical illness, disability, I think the idea of creating workplaces that are we, we talk about flexibility just in terms of hours, but in fact, it should be around work design because what all of us want from people who work with and for us is for them to be able to contribute their best. Mm. And if that requires you to, to think differently about the way you organise work, the tasks you've got people doing, uh, the way you uh, manage them in their workplace, particularly people who've got some sort of, who've said to you, you know, that I have a problem, uh, I have some sort of mental disorder or mental illness, this is what makes me anxious or this is what makes me feel uncomfortable. To be able to organise work around that, I think, uh, gives them the opportunity to continue to contribute to the business and to contribute to their best. And for you running a business or running a small, medium or large business, it gives you the opportunity still to hang on to great people. Uh, who know your business well, who know your customers well, all those things that you can't replace easily. I think the more we think about uh, the design of work in workplaces to accommodate people rather than everyone having to fit into a workplace or a work design that maybe, you know, was thought up 50 years ago mm. and isn't that relevant in the 21st century anyway. So sometimes I think it prompts us to have a good look at what's happening in our work environments. Mm. So the, the design of work is not only about managing out risks uh, that might give rise to these disorders, but also supporting the people through the process. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, and again, these guys have got you know, much better uh, examples probably than I do, but you just know that holding good people is ultimately what you want to do in your business. Mm. And whatever you need to do to make that happen, because uh, if they came in with a broken leg, you'd give them a chair. <laughs> if they come in with uh, and say, you know, I, I need this to be adapted because this has happened and, 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 uh, it's no different really. And I think that's the mindset that we really need mm. to shift because, and you raised the term stigma earlier, that's where there seems to be more stigma about this than there is about other mm. issues that people may raise. And I think getting over that sense that somehow this is different is a really important part of the message if we get any message out today, it's actually getting over that uh, stigma and that it's different. In fact, exactly the same principles apply. Mm. Georgie, um, stigma arises as a result of a number of things, including misconceptions. Mm. Um, and it's not just the stigma, um, it's also misconceptions uh, around um, how you approach it. What are the common misconceptions about people with mental illness that get in the way or cause difficulties? Look, I could talk endlessly about this, but I'll focus on a few. Um, the major one is that uh, having a mental illness or a mental disorder or whatever label or term we want to use is rare. Um, can I say that uh, there is nothing uh, that can be fur further from the truth? One in five Australian workers today are experiencing some kind of mental health problem. Uh, at any point in our lifetime, about nearly half of us will experience some kind of issue. So um, this isn't about other people, it's not about them, it's about us. Um, and uh, from my time working in this sector, um, I've had the extraordinary pleasure to meet the most amazing people who live with all forms of um, mental illness, who are highly functioning, who are extremely accomplished, who run their own businesses, mm. who um, you know, are passionate about what they do and highly productive. Um, so people, you know, people just like us um, are people who live with mental illness. Um, they don't look different, they don't behave differently 
Um, sometimes they behave a little, you know, less less th than they would at other times. But you know, at the end of the day, they are people who are just getting on with their lives. And we come to work bringing all of us. So we don't disaggregate our depression, or we don't, you know, leave our anxiety by the door when we go to work. So, you know, we really need to think about um, the workplace as a place that needs to look after the whole person. And as Anne said, it's about creating a healthy environment at work that. Uh, looks after people's mental health as well as their physical health. The other thing I would uh, stress is that, you know, I quite often um, hear people say, it's never going to happen to me. Well, again, go back to those numbers. Nearly half of us at some stage in our life. Every single family has some kind of story, whether it's a personal story, whether it's something uh, about a relationship, whether it's losing someone to suicide, whether that's a colleague or a, a loved one. Um, the other major... Um, thing that we continue to come up against is that somehow having a mental health um, issue or disorder is somehow a character flaw, somehow a sign of weakness of your personality or of your character. And again, I mean, I have met the most extraordinary people who I admire deeply, um, who are highly functioning and who are far better people than I am. <laughs> um, so again, I would, I would really, really challenge that. Um, we know that people still feel uh, very strongly that people just need to snap out of it. Uh, can you imagine um, the pain that you might be in if you uh, have a huge gash in your leg and blood is spurting out? Would you actually go up to that colleague and say, oh, God, for God's sake, just get up, pick yourself up, you know, sort yourself out and just get on with it? Uh, it is absolutely no different. The, ludic the ludicrousness of that scenario is something that we hear time and time again. And the final thing I'd raise is that the mis misperception that somehow people living with mental illnesses are violent and bad and mad and dangerous. And sometimes when you pick up the papers, uh, y you know, it's not surprising that some sections of society still feel that way. When in fact, the, the truth is that people living with mental illness are far more likely to be the victims of violent crime than the perpetrators. So there's just a quick sort of summary of um, you know, some of the things that we still come across. Perhaps if we can now move to someone who has um, experienced it, um, and not only someone who has experienced it, but has experienced it in the context of small business, being a small business person. Uh, Leanne, you have recovered from a mental illness and I know that you do a lot in the space now mm -hmm. and assist others. Can you just uh, tell us about your experience, what advice you'd give to small business? Mm, certainly. I think um, there's an awful lot of pressure on small business owners in particular and um, when you consider that over 60% of all small businesses in Australia are actually sole operators and, and sometimes we forget that because you see a business name and you think business but in fact that business name is usually a single person. It might be the accountant who works at home doing your taxes once a year. It might be the hairdresser down the road. It could be the truck driver who contracts to Lynn Fox and drives between Melbourne and Sydney every, every week. That's actually the small business person. And I think there's a lot of pressure nowadays for small business people to be a particular type of stereotype. And the reality is that we're not all going to be Richard Branson. Um, and generally, small business is actually a lot of hard work and we don't always share that and we don't necessarily normalise that. So what that meant for me was when my business went through its time of struggle um, back in about 2011 or so, um, if my business in my eyes was failing, then I was a failure. Um, obviously, I'm not as good as everybody else because what I hear about is the success stories and the glory of being an entrepreneur, resilient, tough at all times, able to solve all problems, rich, a go-getter, and I was struggling. Um, so yes, I, was, um, I felt like I was the failure, I must be doing something wrong because everyone else is succeeding, when in fact I learned my experience, as you've mentioned, Georgie, was in fact a shared experience. We just don't talk about it enough in small business. And, and some of the signs that, um, that were triggers or red flags for me were, I would cry on the way to work. And I would sit outside in my car, 
and wipe my tears away and go, get it together, girl, you've got employees because I've got to walk in and I've got to smile and go, hi, it's a great day today. Because as a small business owner, I'm actually exposed to all of these connections. My employees, my customers, my suppliers, my shareholders, my bank manager. If I'm not well, everybody's going to know. So the pressure was quite huge. So I kind of, I actually got to the point where I could no longer work and um, I ended up on the couch, uh, unable to go to work. I was very fortunate. I had um, my husband who's incredibly supportive, who went, look, let's swap roles. I'll go in and and I was so grateful for that because he um, he was the one who was able to to help me get through that period and um, once I sought out some help um, and I was able to uh, get myself back to work then I really had to develop a back to work program for me as the owner the employees had to get used to having me back <laughs> And, and how do you do that? So, and I, I went back to work on a, on a part-time basis, on a casual basis, and worked myself up to go and being able to go back to work. And, and so I don't, I don't think that we always realise that there's so many facets to small business owners who um, do struggle with a mental disorder or a mental illness. Um, that, that's quite a web, I guess, that, that you tend to be in the centre of, so. And small business yeah. owners, sorry if I may, small no, business owners, of course, have invested so <gasps> much oh. in it. It was you, it's your baby, it's your idea, yeah. it's your dream, it's all of those things. So, I mean, the pressure, uh, there, there's an implicit pressure in that. Really, I agree, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, and there, there certainly is, and there's this yeah. wanting to, to tell the world I'm okay, I, I don't want to admit that I'm struggling, when in fact, for me, it, perhaps if I'd, if I'd spoken up earlier and gone and, and sought treatment, I may not have had to have stopped work. I may have been able to work through that at work because mm. I had a great team of employees as well who loved me and loved the business. Um, but I felt I had to live up to this stereotype of what an entrepreneur actually is. And, and that was you know, my undoing, really. So, I think, I think that's such a common experience. And, mm. um, you know... Uh, without wanting to sort of put in gender stereotypes, I'm going to. You know, men in particular, this, our Australian notions of masculinity uh, is such a barrier to, to men actually saying, you know what, I'm really not, I'm struggling. Yeah. I need some help. And, and look at the proportion of males who own small business. Yeah. It's and quite high. I, and I think this whole idea of, um, as Leanne said, you know, showing your vulnerabilities, mm. Mm. saying, you know, yes, I may, might be the boss, I might be the head of this um, organisation, I might be, you know, your employer, but I'm having a tough time. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, I've seen it happen, you know, as Leanne's staff would have rallied around her, they would mm. have said, okay, what can we do to support you? Mm. Mm. The, the phrases that spring to my mind from what you've been saying are, uh, Self-realisation, mm. acceptance of the reality, Absolutely. early intervention, openness mm. with people, yes. um, having everyone a part of the circumstances and the solutions. Absolutely. And that, that mm. includes the suppliers. Mm. That includes the finance sector that you're working with. And, and I think for me, when I was struggling, um, we got to the stage where I had to sit down and have some very honest conversations with my bank manager mm. about what was going on for me and my small business. And so all of those parties that are connected to me as the small business owner, I, I need them to, to help me in my recovery process as well. And, and I was fortunate in that I had some very proactive suppliers who said, hey, you know, we, we love the brand and we love what you're doing and, and we want to ride the process with you. But you're absolutely right, Barry. You have to have a sense of authenticity and honesty about what's going on initially. And, and it's hard to get to that point sometimes and admit, you know, I, I need some help here. It's, it's not quite working for me. That, that's a big decision to, to come out and say that. So particularly when you feel so many people are depending on you as the owner, the business owner. Another interesting point you made is that um, often it's a case of uh, not understanding that others are in the same position, oh. not only with the mental disorder or illness, but also um, with the struggles with the business. Absolutely. Uh, and having, having that peer support 
um, having a network allow you to, to, to better understand yes. it's not just me. Yes, mm. and, and, having, and using the resources that give you the support in that area, like the Heads Up program, for example, because I found when I was feeling like a failure, I actually unsubscribed from every business list. I stopped reading BRW, I stopped buying the fin, because all that did was compare me to somebody who's doing well and I'm failing. So I think it's great to get resources from you know, the mm. areas that recognise, hey, we can help you. George, if we can look another, at another element of the business, um, Leanne's uh, told us of her experience as a business owner. Mm. Um, small business obviously has a small number of staff, very reliant on staff, and obviously uh, stresses um, within the business are amplified. Uh, do you have any practical tips for small business uh, mm. when their staff are struggling? and having these issues? Look, I think the most important tip is, is to um, create uh, from the very start of your, you know, wh whether it's you do it tomorrow or you're setting up a business today and, and, and you're kind of planning what that business is going to look like. Um, uh, create a culture that is um, warm, fun, friendly, that uh, recognises that people have families outside mm. of work, um, that people... Um, sometimes you know come to work and are not as productive as they are at other days so you know that that workplace culture where you know you value your people and that's a genuine thing um, i think other things like you know uh, i mean the, leanne mentioned the heads up uh, initiative so that's headsup.org.au there's a whole range of very practical mm. free easy to implement um, strategies on that make information available about supports make information available about what is a mental illness and what are the signs and symptoms. Talk about it. Talk, have a culture where, you know, you do show mm. your vulnerabilities as a leader. Um, you share stories um, uh, where you encourage, so, so that if, if and when your employees do start to struggle, they feel safe in coming to talk to you and say, look, I've just been diagnosed with X, Y and Z. I'm going to need a little bit of flexibility. Can we work out what that looks like? Mm. Um, and then you sit down with that person with empathy, mm. uh, even though every fibre of your being as a small business owner might be saying, oh my God, I've only got five people and this is going to be massive and how am I going to figure out, how am I going to move the chess pieces around to cover mm. all of the things that we need to do? Sit down with that person and have a genuine conversation. Um, you know, I'm worried about you. You're not being yourself. Um, what is going on for you? How can we support you? If we do this for you, do you think you can pick up a bit of work here? Uh, you know, so reallocate duties. Um, it's really about uh, just, as Anne said, treating people like human beings. Yeah. And, and if a person has a broken leg, you'd say, right, okay, do you need a taxi to and from work? Or, you know, how, how are we going to adjust your workspace so that, so that you can actually work productively? Um, so there's a whole range of things, but I think, you know, in essence, it's about the culture, it's about leadership, it's about being open and honest and talking about this stuff, and then it's about understanding what adjustments you can make and, and mm. being assertive and confident in having those negotiations with, with the individual staff member who may be struggling. Mm. And, I, and I think to add to that, we've got to also, that's why destigmatizing is really important and taking the fear out of it. Mm. You know, because once we did, anyone who showed any signs of um, not coping, you know, was yeah. sort of suddenly to be feared and sent away. I mean, yeah. it's not that long ago that that's how we used to manage any sort of mental illness. And I think we now are in a completely different world where supporting people, keeping them engaged, we know is the right way forward. And of course, Safe Work Australia on its website has got a lot of mm. advice and support for small business operators as well. So yeah. there's lots of areas you can go if you're not sure, if you're thinking, what the hell do I do now? How do I manage this? Oh my goodness. There's plenty of places to go yeah. for very hands-on practical advice, simply mm. written uh, that you can step through and really help to think about it. Mm. I'm confident that you're um, getting a lot out of this, but I'd again remind the studio audience and those online that uh, it, it, it is very important that you get the most out of this session and I'd again encourage you uh, to send us any questions. Uh, we do have a, a web question. So, uh, um, are farmers being included in the small business group? I'll throw that open. 
Uh, we're actually running a project at the moment with uh, Beyond Blue and um, we're, we're, we put together a group of small business owners um, to uh, look at some of the material that Beyond Blue are working um, under the Heads Up umbrella. And so I would extend that invitation to any, any farmers um, to come please, please join us because um, we're, we're really looking for a diversity in, in opinion from small business. And, and farms are you know, often a family owned, um, you know, traditional uh, type small business. And yes, please um, come and join us. Send me an email, um, contact me through Safe Work Australia and, um, and um, I'll gladly add you to, um, to our group. And from a safe work point of view, of course, yes is the answer to that. Uh, you're absolutely in the target sweet spot for small mm. business. Um, but the other thing, of course, we understand that farming is a classic, uh, one of those classic businesses with lots of highs and lots oh. of lows, where you're weather dependent, uh, technology, you know, there's lots of stress points. And uh, so, in fact, we're very keen to make sure that we reach out to the farming community as part of what we're doing as well. We've just finished a, uh, a national roadshow where we got a beautiful old 1980 Bedford bus <laughs> called Roadshow Ronda. Um, and we drove 65,000 kilometres, I think, around Australia and spent a lot of that time out, out, you know, out of cities. Um, where every time we went into a farming um, area or a rural community, it's extraordinary how struck we were. And it's, you know, it's, it's not surprising. Um, at the number of farmers and farmers' wives who came up to us and, and were very open about their experiences. I mean, it's a, as Anne said, it's a tumultuous time mm. and um, the vagaries of the weather and, and uh, stock markets and all kinds of things can have a profound effect on your business success. Mm. So what, I mean, we've, and a bit of an offshoot from that, we'd, we've got one of our staff, um, uh, the dad, he was a volunteer bus driver for a while, Charlie, Charlie and Barb, his wife, who are old f uh, farmers from uh, Vic country Victoria, are now uh, driving their Winnebago around uh, country Victoria, country New South Wales and Queensland, and going to all the agricultural shows, actually mm -hmm. giving out free information and resources and talking to farmers mm -hmm. about this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing right. to target mm -hmm. farmers. We have another web question, um, if we can go to that. As a supervisor of staff with serious mental health conditions, what support can I get? Georgie? Uh, look, um, there are a range of supports that you can get. I mean, I think, um, you know, as I said earlier, the Heads Up uh, website contains a range of very practical guides and resources, tips, tricks uh, about how to effectively and empathetically, but also, you know, with confidence and, and firmness manage um, you know, the, 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 the ebbs and flows of someone who works for you has, has a, a severe mental illness. Um, so those range from, you know, uh, f phone lines to call, where you'll speak to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, there's our online forums where you can share information. We have got a LinkedIn mm -hmm. community, where, which is growing by the day in yes. terms of membership. Uh, where again you can swap stories and you can get some ideas from people who work in you know in a similar environment that about what worked for them what didn't. Um, there's also you know a range of supports on that uh, and resources on that on the Heads Up website that, for example, teach you how to approach having a decent conversation with someone, how to plan a return to work that's effective, um, how to you know what to say what not to say and and. You know, again, it's about building confidence. It's about saying you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to diagnose. Please don't diagnose, in fact. Um, but just uh, know, you know, build your skills, rehearse it. And, you know, again, it's just about sitting down and having a very human conversation with someone, a very honest conversation, and saying, okay, how can we work together on this? Because as an employer, you have your rights and your responsibilities just as your employee has their rights and responsibilities. It is a two-way street and the only way it's going to work is if everybody realises that mm. and, and comes to the party together. We do have another web question and I'm very pleased to see them coming through. Uh, not everyone works in an enlightened workplace. How do you convince the CEO or line manager to change, that is, bottom-up driven initiative? 
Uh, and I suppose that's something in common with all aspects of health and mm. safety. And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, I've mentioned Are You OK Day. I think the great things about those sort of campaigns is that they do tend to be bottom up. Uh, and I know there are, I've, and I've heard stories of a number of workplaces where that question was asked and suddenly people are saying, well, actually, I'm not. You know, I'm really struggling and that uh, their peer uh, workers start to gather around them and then collectively go to their management and say, uh, you, you know, we think we need to deal with this differently. So I think there are ways of doing that. Um, it's, ne it's not as easy in a workplace where you don't have support. Uh, maybe you can sit your CEO or line management down and you can watch a replay of this. Uh, say there is another way that lots of workplaces are talking about it. People do think it's an important issue and it does need managing differently or refer them to the website if they need a bit of support and uh, uh, advice. But, you know, work, pe your peer group in a workplace can also come together and I think ask for change in workplaces. They can get engaged in a number of the public campaigns, get someone to come in and speak at your workplace, mm. to all to your management and your co-workers. There are lots of ways and small things you can do, I think, just to create awareness in a workplace. Again, exactly the same way as, you know, once no one talked about the fact that they um, they had breast cancer and now everyone's, you know, shaving their hair and raising money. So mm. I think those things have changed very quickly over, you know, just it's only taken a few years for workplaces to grab hold of those issues. I think exactly the same thing applies when we're talking about mental disorder and mental illness as well. Gather together and support each other. My, my tip would be figure out what the CEO who's reluctant, yeah. uh, what pushes his or her buttons? I mean, quite often I go into boardrooms and to executive meetings and I say to CEOs very directly, if you are not taking this stuff seriously, Firstly, you're losing money. You're not an employer of choice. You're not going to attract the best and brightest people who are going to be loyal, productive and hardworking for you. And quite frankly, you're behind the time. So get, get with the program. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we're pretty direct about it. We've got some really strong evidence that shows that for every dollar that you invest in a mentally healthy, initi mental healthy, mentally healthy workplace initiative, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, you see on average return of $2.30. So those are really good returns and that increases um, for small business because of the proximity between mm -hmm. a CEO or a leader and their, their staff. So I mean, I, I put it as a business prop proposition and, and also that, you know, if you want to be considered a strong and uh, effective leader, you need to be doing this and you need to be doing this authentically. If I might make a comment, um, you might ask the question of the CEO, we have first aid officers who are mm. trained, what about mental health first exactly. aid officers? Exactly. And uh, I might say as a, a trained mental health first aid officer myself, I've found it to be uh, an incredibly, incredibly fulfilling role mm. personally, mm. but also the benefits for the organisation from that transparency, the destigmatising uh, getting it out there, it's, it's an enormous benefit. Yeah. Some of the most effective um, uh, results we're seeing in the businesses that we're working with is those who embrace the idea of peer champions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, the, work, mm -hmm. the workshop foreman um, you know, the union delegate, the, or, you know, or just the, you know, the person who slices the bread, um, but, but that people trust. Um, that, that is empathetic yes. and that understands um, you know, the, the realities of the, work, uh, the workplace. I, I think um, and you know, applying that into a small business environment, say uh, you might be a micro business and only have yourself, the owner and three employees, so four of you. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a CEO, you're all working side by side on the you know, same level, on the same project. And I think in that instance, it comes down to uh, developing a business culture. So, for example, for me, with Billy Goat, we would have once a month, we'd have small staff luncheons, we called them bleat and eat, where <laughs> you could sit and eat, but you could also talk about things. And I think if you have in a small business where it's not as formal, you, you don't have you know, a mental health um, safety officer, you don't have those resources, but what you do have is an intimate connection with one another. And I think if you can create that in a small business environment that may in fact initially not have anything to do with mental health and my mental, my mental wellbeing, 
but I have a culture where we feel comfortable enough to talk and share with one another, mm. then I may be more comfortable even going to the boss and saying to the boss, are you okay? Mm. Yeah. Mm. One thing, if I may, before we take another web question, um, the question about the farmer mm. raises something um, which has kind of been underlying under the surface but not discussed today, and that is the, the male side of things, <laughs> men. Mm. Uh, the macho, we're strong, we mm. don't cry, and so forth. Far from the reality, and um, that may have a number of bases to it. How do we overcome that? Mm. It's an interesting question because I'm on the board of Australian Rugby mm. and uh, we've talked about this quite a lot. Uh, the use, for example, of sports people, both as role models on the positive, but also to mm. talk about uh, their own struggles. And we've seen a bit of that lately uh, when quite high profile sports people have been prepared to say, I have an issue, mm -hmm. I need time out, I'm not managing, um, I do have a long-term issue that I need to sort through and we saw that with uh, in the AFL and some of the other codes. So mm -hmm. I think given sport and masculinity uh, in Australia in particular are so inextricably linked, uh, I think it is an issue that is getting prominence through sport, but also inside sporting organisations, we're talking about it a lot because we know uh, fear of failure is you know, often an anxiety trigger. Uh, it's mm. really a, a make or break for lots of players. You're either in the big team or you're not. You know, there's a, uh, there are lots of stress points as you go through it. And often we're, we're dealing with young uh, people when they're relatively vulnerable and, uh, and so on as well. So I think the issue of uh, men speaking out is an important one that we've got to grapple with. Mm. Uh, and you're okay. right to uh, align that with the issue with farmers as well because mm. we've seen such high suicide rates, for example, yes. among the farming community, where clearly the inability to find someone to talk to uh, at a critical point th throws you over yeah. the edge. And we've seen it in sport as well, mm. you know, where the inability to connect at the right time. So we're focused on partnering with organisations like Beyond Blue to make mm. sure those conversations are had. Uh, we're very focused on bringing it out into the open so that if you are suffering any sort of mental disorder or you're anxious or all of those things mm. that ultimately could lead to a longer term problem, we start to talk about them early rather than late because mm. uh, you don't want to leave okay. it too late because then people mm. uh, have sort of got themselves into the zone of not talking and feeling you know, as you described, a feeling yeah. as though the world was against them, there's no one to talk to and you get, you end up on the couch yeah. or even worse. So I think, um, uh, you know, real men, real men talk, real men mm. do cry. Yeah. <laughs> we need to start talking about the world we live in in a different way uh, and for men to be talking about it like mm. that as yeah. well. And so I, I think we need to be hearing some honest small business stories yeah. more in the media. So we need more real stories yeah. to be told about the realities of running and owning a small business. And, and you know, the majority of men actually are small business owners when you look at the breakdown, the demographic. So we should have some more male business leaders telling their truth, yeah. living their truth. So I, I think that would definitely help to encourage yeah. more in the community to speak so up. So com a combination of role models to normalise, yeah. um, but also um, to provide that community, community understanding, community support. Mm. 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 Absolutely. There's a really important factor um, that we found out through our research in, in, in targeting our work towards men, um, and that's using humour. Mm. Mm. Um, we don't, when, we, when we're engaging with men, um, we don't talk about mental illness. Um, we don't, we talk about, you know, relationship difficulties or, you know, you're worried about mm. losing a job or if you've got financial stresses. Um, you know, you talk about mental illness, crickets. Uh, so uh, we've, we've developed a, a campaign called Man Therapy, which <laughs> is basically uh, a therapy that's so manly it'll put hairs on your brain. Um, and that's fronted by a fictional doctor called Dr. Brian Ironwood, who is incredibly rude, <laughs> incredibly inappropriate, um, but, you know, speaks in manly ways to men mm. Mm. and gives manly tips yeah. um, through, through using right. humour. So, I mean, there's a whole range mm. of, of resources out there. 
And, and again, you know, if you're a small business owner worried about a, a bloke who's working for you, you know, just leave a, you know, write down mantherapy.org.au and yeah. just leave it on his desk. Um, call Beyond Blue for some man therapy resources. Um, we've yeah. also, uh, Dr. Brian didn't work with blue collar workers. So we've just introduced a new character called Davo, mm -hmm. who's a larrikin tradie. Um, and again, he's, you know, he tested his socks off with blue collar workers and we launched him a couple of months ago. And again, you know, he talks in, in, in very plain English. Um, he swears, he farts, he, you know, does all kinds of inappropriate things. And he's fantastic. And he's fantastic. <laughs> and men love him. Mm. But you know what? There's a very serious message. And we message. all live with a bit of each of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a very serious message underneath and very, very practical ways to engage men and then point them towards the, uh, the supports that are available. Well, I, I will pick up the manly voice part of all that <laughs> and throw to the next web question if I can. Mm. Um, are there workplace programs I can sign staff up to so they can get some training and guidance about how to deal with mental illness in the workplace? Well, I think, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, work, the Safe Work Australia website has a whole lot of material there, but it's not actually a training program, which is probably more in your space. Yeah, so again, you know, I sound like a crack record, but headsup.org.au mm. is, um, is a one-stop shop for this, yeah. for this kind of stuff. It's, it's a Beyond Blue initiative, but it's actually powered by a Mentally Healthy Workplace Alliance, of which Safe Work Australia is a fantastic partner. Mm. And on that website, the final section is about resources and information and, and supports. And um, there's a whole range of, uh, pr of online learning, um, online training, education materials, um, but also links to evidence-based workplace training programs, some of which are free, some of which are user pays, um, uh, not just from Beyond Blue, but from other fantastic organisations like Black Dog and SANE. Mm. So everything, if you go to that section, there's a whole range of, of ideas there. Mm. You can choose the one that you think will fit you and your business the best. The other thing I'd, I'd suggest that you do is think about getting someone with a lived experience of mental illness mm. into your workplace to actually break mm. down that stigma. Uh, we've got a speakers bureau of about, um, oh, I think it's about 350 fantastic people now who we support to, to tell their stories and they're all over Australia so again just pick up the phone, give your blue a call and we can arrange a speaker for your workplace. And to flip back on the question, it's probably also, um, all of those things are absolutely important but if you think you've got an issue and you want to change the way your workplace is thinking about this, maybe the first thing to do is just get everyone together mm. and to have a conversation mm. about it. So maybe step one isn't a training program, maybe step one is a conversation with everyone together, using some of mm. the external material perhaps, but you know, asking people if, if they have issues, if they've got stories to share, mm. have they worked in other workplaces where it's been done differently and better? Because I'm, I'm sure inside every workplace are a lot of great ideas that haven't ever been surfaced. And that's true on every issue, but I, I think on this issue in particular, where people haven't been prepared to speak publicly, or maybe, you know, the opportunity mm. hasn't been there, to just get you, the right. team together and yeah. say, what do you think would be the next yeah. way forward? And here's some material we can yeah. use to inform it. I agree, I agree. And I think um, in the conversation we had the other week, you used the term vulnerable leadership. And um, I thought that that was just a, a brilliant way to capture um, how we might be able to help one another in the workplace is uh, it's not it's not particularly easy to sit here and go listen everyone I think I failed <laughs> and I had depression <laughs> it's actually not easy to do that however by sharing my story and by saying I'm in a leadership role and I'm not quite sure about what's going on here then we open the way for mm -hmm. others to then say hey if, if she doesn't feel that way then it, maybe it's okay for me to, to, you know, be unsure myself, so. Look, this is, this is my first CEO gig, and what I found works really well for me and makes me look really intelligent <laughs> is to um, ask my staff what they think. Yeah. It's amazing, yeah. the depth of knowledge and the, mm -hmm. the kind of, and it, quite often we, we get it wrong as leaders. Mm. You know, we assume we know what our workers want or what's going to make the biggest difference to our employees. Quite often we get it wrong. Mm. So, so Anne's right. Myth of the great myth of leadership <laughs> that it all resides, you get to the top of the organisation and there it all sits that's in one right. person. That's right. That's not how it works at all. Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly and the smartest right. leaders actually are the people who ask their own teams for ideas. Yeah. Most great ideas actually sit close to where the problems are. Mm. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, we could go on for quite some time. We are getting near the end of the session. Uh, there is another web question, but before we do, and I should have perhaps made mention of this earlier, uh, this is a very serious topic. Now, when we talk about support, obviously organisations have their employee assistance programs and they should be encouraged to be used, but also, and I understand they are on the system for you to see, uh, the very critical and important contacts for uh, Beyond Blue, Lifeline and others who can provide that immediate support to you. So if this is causing you any concern, if this session is raising issues and you would like to talk to somebody, we really would encourage you to take advantage uh, of that and do so. Um, the next uh, web question, I'm afraid we'll need to make this the last. Um, as an employer, what are my legal obligations? Well, again, I'd encourage you to have a look at the uh, Safe Work Australia website. Your legal obligations are, they, are the same as they are in every environment. You have an obligation to provide a safe workplace. You have an obligation to your employees. You have an obligation, essentially, to take all reasonable steps. Mm -hmm. And we can help you work through that if you have a look at the website and the material on this that helps you make your judgment call on that. But I think, um, look, common sense says that as an employer, your obligation is, is to provide a safe workplace. And mm -hmm. that means making sure you understand your people, you understand their needs, uh, that you do, again, what's reasonable. And the test is a reasonableness test. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm not sure, I mean, I could, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a very long-winded legal answer around this. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm in the position, I think, of uh, really encouraging you to look for the good advice, that's, look at the good advice that's available mm. for you as an employer, where we've, s we've stripped away a lot of the noise so that you can read it simply and understand your obligations. Safe Work Australia website. And if I may, as, as a lawyer, the, the practicality of it is twofold. You mentioned design before, yep. things like understanding the way you structure work, yep. Uh, rosters, work pressures and so forth, which can contribute to the problem. But the other is um, relationships, and we talked about the dynamic and how supporting it can be. Mm. The other side of that coin is destructive relationships mm. and interactions. So it's as much about things like making sure that workplace behaviour is appropriate, mm. stamping out inappropriate workplace behaviour such as bullying, and uh, that's part of the legal obligation of the employer. Mm. Thank you. One of the questions I think that we get asked quite a lot is, um, can I actually ask about a mental health problem, you know, uh, details about someone's mental illness? Um, and you absolutely have a legal right to ask legitimate questions or certain questions where it's legitimate, where it's, benef beneficial, where it's beneficial for you and the employee and where it's actually necessary. So, for example, if someone is operating heavy machinery you, and they've, you're aware through you know, the, the disclosure of that person that they have a mental health mm. um, diagnosis, you have every right to ask them about their medication. Mm. For example, does it make them drowsy? Um, so there are certain questions that you are actually legally entitled to make to protect the safety of that person and other people working with them. I think there's a common sense test in this, really, yeah. isn't there? Mm. And I, I often hear people say, oh, I can't do it. You know, I'm a business owner. I'm not allowed to do anything. That's not true. Mm. Um, uh, you are, I mean, you have obligations, but also you have plenty of rights as well yeah. to mm. ask reasonable Absolutely. questions, to ask people if they're all right, to make sure that you are creating a safe work environment for everyone else. You know, there's, mm. a, um, there's a lot in that dynamic, which ultimately, I think, is about you asking plenty of questions and getting the, a right uh, amount of information to make good judgments. So the idea that you're not allowed to do anything, you're not allowed to ask, you're not allowed, uh, it's a lot of that is hearsay and myth. Mm. And yeah. again, I'd encourage you to get good information before doing anything. If you're not sure, ask. Mm. Pick up the phone, go to the website. Absolutely. There's lots of information out there, but ask the question. And I think to conclude on that point, and Leanne made the point very well early on, is that with a small business, it is like a family. Mm. And you do talk to your family. You do care about your family. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with your employees. We do need to finish. Um, the, after a short break, uh, the, each of the panel members will be available online to answer questions, and I'd certainly encourage you to. Uh, but before we do conclude, 
and it'll need to be very brief. Um, can I ask for an insight from each of you, starting with Leanne? Uh, I think um, from a small business owner perspective and from my lived experience is um, I've had a realisation that my mental health challenges were actually survivable. Um, and I, at the time when I was experiencing, experiencing it, I would have said no. But in fact, it's just day by day. Um, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I think um, um, you know, if, it, when I sit down and talk to small business people who are, um, who are struggling, it, it's, it's just so important to, to, to say that there, there is hope at the end and, and it is survivable. Georgie? Mental illness is everywhere. Mm. You know, it affects all of us. Um, stress is anxiety, depression, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think, you know, let's stop pretending and let's start getting real about this mm. being something that is not about other people. The second thing I'd say is, um, and, it, and this, is, this was said to me by the most magnificent woman who lives with schizophrenia, Janet Marr, who is, uh, was, was an inaugural men National Mental Health Commissioner, is an internationally renowned um, consumer advocate for people living with mental illness. And she once said to me, and I remember this very clearly, she said, Georgie, having a mental illness is not an excuse for bad behaviour. Mm. It affects me sometimes, it affects my performance, but it is not an excuse for bad behaviour. And that's, I think, you know, so don't be scared about this stuff. Um, I'll stop there. Mm. I, I guess my last point is that ultimately great workplaces have great cultures and are led by great people. And in all the talk of what happens in workplaces, those three things uh, are really at the core of everything that we want to see. Uh, and all of that is underpinned by great communication. Mm -hmm. So talk, 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 talk. Well, that produces a very good final message. We all need to be and want to be as great as we can, but we can't necessarily be. And if you have struggles or concerns or issues with what you perceive to be failure, do something about it, get it out there in the open, the earlier it's dealt with, the better. Thank you all very much for attending today. Hopefully everyone got something out of it. Um, as I say, with a, after a short break, uh, the panellists will be available to answer questions online. And good luck to you all. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you very much.